Open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we will be closing off chapter 1 this morning as we continue our meditation on the glorious Redeemer. And why, I, I wanted to explain why is, is the title still The Glorious Redeemer when we're seeing a call to action. And, and it says we've meditated in our hymns this morning. The call to action has to have a source. Our loving actions towards one another, our engagements, our obedience need to come from a fountainhead. And, I, and I've often said it, it's the reason why I, I love the hymn, Trust and Obey So Much. So much so that I, that I assure you, it will be in my funeral. It really will. It, it is a, a glorious hymn that presents the reality that the reason why we obey is a trusting, loving relationship to our Redeemer. It is not a fake obedience that is superficial. And we know this because there are those that can force themselves for a season to obey, but inevitably fall away. They're the ones that John said they came out from us, that it might be made evident that they were never of us. But for those that are the elect, the redeemed, this truth stands. We love him because he first loved us. And that love is focused on the person of Jesus Christ, our glorious Redeemer. It, it is a meditation on the pearl of great price. It is a, a, a reality, a realistic meditation on the wonderful, glorious Redeemer that should move us to action. And that, that is the reason why the meditation and the title has been The Glorious Redeemer. Because the, the reality of it is, when you truly love, it is always followed by action. That's just a fact. It's always followed by fruits of love. Sincere fruit of love. And scripture reveals that to be a truth in the Christian life. So we will be reading, once again, verses 20 to 25, but we will be starting in verses 22 and going on to verse 25. Before that, though, let us bow our heads and go to the throne of grace, which is our right in Christ Jesus, our glorious Redeemer. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you for your kindness and your goodness, for the, the hope we have of an inheritance, imperishable, unfading, being kept for us by you, Lord God. And we thank you at the same time, Lord, that your word reveals to us that we are also being kept for that inheritance through faith, Lord. We thank you for the work that you are doing in our lives day by day in renewing us through the truth of your word in conformity to the image of Christ. Lord God, as we've expressed in our Theology 101 class this morning, we are, by nature, vile sinners. But we have the glorious truth expressed in the hymns. Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. And Lord, we thank you for that wonderful redemption. So Father, Father, our Father, as we come this morning before you, we ask for ears that hear and a mind that comprehends and a heart that stores and an affection to act upon these truths, Lord God, that we might be not just hearers of your words, but doers of it. We ask this in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Read with me verses 20 to 25 of First Peter chapter 1. He was foreknown, speaking of our Redeemer, before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who, are, who through him are believers in God, who raised him 
from the dead and gave him, that is our Redeemer, glory, so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For, quote, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. We could continue, and I want you to see the progression. This Word, the Word of God, the unfailing, unending, living Word of God. This Word is the good news that was preached to you. And chapter 2, verse 1 begins, So put away all malice and all deceit, sorry, all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. I want you to see the connection between these. Because as you guys should know by now, this whole chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, wasn't in the letter that was written. These are ways that we have categorized these things. And I want to make sure we don't lose the flow of this. Peter is building upon what he has said previously. And so if we recall, last week we were talking about this glorious Redeemer who was foreknown Before the foundation of the world, we talked about that wonderful theological reality of foreknowledge and predestination and how he was manifest in the last times. The truth that we are Latter-day Saints in the biblical sense, not in the heretical Mormon sense. We are the saints of God living in the last times and how Christ was made manifest for the sake of you, which you, the believers... You who through this great Redeemer are made believers in God, the same God who raised our Redeemer from the dead. And again, we meditated on how central to the Christian faith is the reality of the resurrection. We were speaking lightly on it, touching lightly on it in our Theology 101 class. The reality that we have a hope, a true and sincere hope that our soul and body will only be parted for a time. And this flesh that is at this time battled and riddled with war of a sinful nature will not be in that time of the resurrection of the dead. We will have glorified bodies, bodies free of that imputed sinful nature that we received from Adam. That is the resurrection we have in the hope through Jesus Christ's resurrection. God who raised him, our Redeemer, from the dead and gave him glory. Why? That glory was given to the resurrected Christ so that your faith and hope may be in God. And we talked about how it is that God gave his seal of approval over everything that Christ said. So when Christ was speaking to the Jews and he said, You are children of your father, Satan. You are children of your father, the devil, and you act in accordance with the nature that belongs to Satan. Rebellion and lies and murder. And that is important. We have to bear these two natures in mind as we come to verse 22. The reality of the redeemed. The reality of what the new birth means. Our faith and our hope are in God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And that resurrection means that when Christ said to his disciples and to us by proxy, I'm going to prepare a place for you, that applies to us. 
that the promise of a glorified body, the promise of a mind that is no, no longer battling with dementia or Alzheimer's or depression or anxiety or the stresses of this life will be no more. Why? Because our Redeemer is the resurrection and the life. And so we get to verse 22, the commandment. So because of these truths, you have your hope and your life and your faith set in God through this Redeemer. You are to love one another. Verse 22 says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, and we know that truth to be the word of God. Your word is truth. For a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. There are truths that are expressed here pertaining to regeneration. You are saved. You are redeemed. And that means you have new affections. It's as Pastor Aaron was talking in the Theology 101 class. You now have a new nature, a spirit-given nature that puts within you desires and affections to obey God. But there is something important for us to, to see here about the process of sanctification. And Peter's already touched on this when he was talking about sanctification and the refining fire like gold. So we have to consider that the trials that we undergo are tests, as James has told us, of obedience. God is testing our love for him. That's something that we should already know from James. So we see these truths as a refining fire, which purifies us, which grows us, and we see that truth expressed more clearly here. Having purified your souls, our souls, we are being purified through our obedience to the truth, through our obedience to the word of God. Each time we pass a trial, a test, and we mature, we are more purified. We are refined more. In, in a sense, we could put it this, this way. The truth that is expressed by Peter here is simply this. As you've passed through the trials, as you are obeying, you are more and more Christ-like. And because you are more Christ-like, you are to strive to emulate Christ in a sincere brotherly love. Dr. Sproul comments, there is much written here for our consideration. Peter indicates that our souls are purified through obedience. Yet the reason we fail to give God due obedience is that our souls are not yet purified. We usually think that purification of the soul take pl takes place so that we will obey God. Yet here, strikingly, the apostle tells us that purification is not only unto obedience, but also by obedience. The more our souls are involved in obedience the greater the purification that occurs. And the more our souls are purified, the greater our obedience will be. This is not a vicious cycle, but a glorious cycle by which obedience feeds purification and symbiotically, Purification feeds obedience. The obeying of which Peter speaks is obedience to the truth. Our culture is against the idea of objective truth. And this antipathy is rooted and grounded in fallen humanity's fundamental hostility to the truth itself. People do not want truth to be objective. We do not want truth to be binding upon our conscience because by nature, truth is our enemy and we do not want to submit to it. Or as Peter says here, we do not want to obey it. The tragedy of fallen humanity is that we tend to give ourselves in obedience to the lie, to, which, to that which is false. 
but the purification of our souls comes in obeying the truth. It's not enough simply to hear the truth. It's not enough even to recite the truth of the creeds. It's not enough to affirm our agreement with the propositions of the truth. Peter says there is a deeper step, which is to obey the truth. Such obedience happens through the Spirit. Peter is speaking here of that process of growth and development in the Christian life that we call sanctification, which is dependent on the operation and energizing influence of the Holy Spirit. I will never obey the truth of God apart from the power, grace, and assistance of the Spirit. And this shows us the truth that only the true Christians can love in this way. But we also see, as I stressed when we were in James, once again, the reality that the scriptures herald the truth of spiritual maturity, of sanctification, and of obedience. There is a call here to purify your souls by obedience. And there is a context about what we are supposed to do. We obey the word of God. And the commandment of God tells us to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And that pure heart can only be a regenerate heart. We purify ourselves by our obedience to God's word for a purpose. We purify ourselves not for the sake of simple purification. We're not just taking a shower for a shower's sake. In a spiritual sense, we are purifying our souls, maturing spiritually, passing through the refining fire for a purpose that we may obey better, that we may glorify better, that we may love better, love vertically, obviously, first and foremost, because that obedience is love to God. I love you, God, so I want to obey your word. I want to be obedient unto what you have called me to do, and you have called me to love my brother brethren, as you have called me to do so. This is why Peter says, for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Underlying these truths of purification by obedience and the call to love sincerely and earnestly is the truth that only the redeemed can, only the saved, if you will, can love from a pure heart. And this is a truth that we should already be familiar to. So for a moment, we'll have kind of a flashback or an echo, if you will, of where we were in 1 John. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, I could go through a whole lot of the scriptures to demonstrate that, but 1 John is where we've been already. It's somewhere that should be somewhat familiar to us. So we're going to see how this truth about love and redemption, love and sanctification, love, and regeneration, love and being a child of God is demonstrated. So we'll be in 1 John chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 3, 10 through 11, 16 through 18, so 1 through 3, 10 through 11, because I know some of y'all are writing it down, 16 through 18, 23 to 24, and chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, all speaking about how to love and the connection between love and regeneration. I'm just going to read them all straight through. 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. 
And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Again, emphasis here on verse 3, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So here we have the same truths being heralded. Love. This love is not a love that is natural to us, but it is a love given unto us by the Father at the new birth that we should be called children of God and we are God's children now. As such, everyone who thus hopes, everyone who has this love, purifies himself as he, our Redeemer, our God, is pure. By this, he says in verse 10 and 11, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness, obedience, is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And this goes right back to what Christ had already said, and we touched on this morning in our Theology 101 class. These are the two great commandments. The first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second isn't equal, but it is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Christ said to his disciples in John 13, love one another. By this, this is a defining characteristic. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples. By this, the world will know that you are redeemed, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is a command heralded, obviously, first by Christ, heralded by John, heralded by Peter, heralded by Paul, we are to love one another. And the only way that we can love is, we are, is if we are children of God. Continuing in 1 John. By this, verse 16, we know love. That he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. This is the kind of love that Peter is talking about here when he says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. It is shown in actions. It means if you have a brother who has a need and you have the means by which you can supply that need, do it. This is how you demonstrate love. But as we've talked about several other times, the peculiar kind of love we demonstrate for brothers in Christ has to be diametrically different than the love we display to the world. It has to be. It has to be a clarion call, our love, the action of love has to be a clarion call that puts a thirst in the hearts and minds and mouths of the worldly. They are to see, wow, those people love each other a lot. And they love each other distinctly. That's why it's a bastardization to love the worldly like you love a Christian. It is a spit in the face of the command that Christ has given and the distinction that he gave to love the world like you love a Christian. What are you giving them to desire? Recently, Elon Musk was interviewed by the Babylon Bee people. And they gave what I could only say is the worst gospel presentation that, that you could ever see. Really, these are supposed to be Christian men, and yet they presented the most horrible gospel presentation you could ever imagine. Like, hey, so you want to be a Christian? God loves you. And the response from Elon was basically the same. Well, yeah, I want to be loved. That sounds great. 
there was no objective truth presented. No distinction made between children of God and children of Satan. And we have to make sure that we don't get squishy in that regard. There is a line. We didn't draw that line. God did. God shows that line very clearly. And our call is come be loved. But that requires something from you. Repentance. A recognition of sin. We cannot love the world the same way we love each other. We stop and we think how Paul drove some of this home when he was talking about the food offered to idols. He said, hey, food offered to idols is nothing. It's not something that's going to trip you up if you're a mature Christian. Unless the person shows up and says, hey, this porterhouse piece of meat was just sacrificed to Dionysus. Let's chow down together. Then you are convictionally bound. You know what? No. It's not going to do it. So for, for the sake of that, eat whatever's placed in front of you. Right? But then Paul presents a different case. Now you're with a brother in Christ. And this brother in Christ is weaker. On the one hand, and think about this, guys, because it's important. On the one hand, you want to win this guy for Christ who's about to offer you food that may or may not be sacrificed to idols. And on the other, you have your brother who's already saved. And he finds out this food is sacrificed to idols. What do you do? Do you eat it to try and win this guy to Christ? No. No. Scripture tells us otherwise. You show your love first and foremost to the brother. Even if it means that you're going to offend the worldly person instead of winning them. You say, you know what? I'm not going to eat this. This is offered unto an idol and my brother is convictionally bound not to eat this meat. So for the sake and for the love of my brother in Christ, I will not partake. And that is a greater testimony than what this world shows. People nowadays will go and break a leg to try and win a worldly person, to try and not offend a worldly person, but they will not demonstrate a breaking leg, take off your shirt and give it to a brother, give them some extra food and help them build a fence, love to their brother in Christ. We have to understand the biblical concept of love and the command echoed over and over again to love each other more. We are the priority and that is a difficult reality. It is a painfully difficult reality because that means we have to go to the scriptures and see what the scriptures have to say about our interfamilial interactions. How do we engage with a family member depending on where they are? If they're worldly, our interactions are going to be different than if they're apostate, than if they're a false teacher, than if they are a false professor. And Scripture highlights clearly everything ranging from try and win them to Christ to don't even eat with such a person. Don't let them into your home. Don't have anything to do with them. Why? So that they might want. So that they might be one. It's hard to say, brother, I love you and I want you to come to Christ and I'm going to display that love by not talking to you anymore. It sounds completely upside down until you see that's what scripture says. Don't even eat with such a one. You can't come into my house until you repent. You want the love that I display to my brothers and sisters in Christ? You want the kind of love that says here, I, I, I'm to love you in deed and in truth, then repent and I'll love you. But when you blatantly ignore what the scriptures have to say, you are sinning against what God has explicitly commanded. Continuing, and this is the commandment that we love sorry, and this is the commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another. Just as he has commanded us, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. 
Again, obedience, love, obedience, love, and how those two things demonstrate that the Holy Spirit abides in us and that in reality and in truth demonstrates that we are saved. And John continues to drive the point that Peter heralds in chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is is from God. And if you remember, when I preached on this, I belabored the point, God is the one that defines what love is. We don't. We do not have that right. We can't say, I'm going to love however I want to love. No, God determines how we love to the T, how we express that love, and the fact that love is an action and not merely an emotion. Love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So again, that truth, that the fruit of love, after all, we see that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. That fruit is demonstrating, or demonstrating, pardon, that we are His children. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this love, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. His love is perfected in us. It is a growing process. It's that same sanctification. It's that same purification that Peter is talking about. We grow in our ability to demonstrate that love. If there is no love for the brethren, that peculiar, agape kind of love for the redeemed, a love so dynamically different from what the world offers, then the biblical truth is there is no salvation. There is no regeneration in such a person. So when Peter says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, he's speaking of an action only the redeemed, only the elect are truly capable of. This is a truth heralded in Scripture, a truth we just saw in 1 John and we see here in 1 Peter. And Peter further further connects this truth by the declaration he has in verse 23. Since you have been born again, this is able to happen. You're able to purify your souls. You're able to work with the Holy Spirit in the process of sanctification. And you're able to demonstrate a true biblical love from a sincere and pure heart because... You have been born again. I honestly think it's a, it's a truth that has been lost in the times. I think one of the worst things that happened in modern evangelicalism was the seeker movement. That that point in time when churches started saying, yeah, you know what? I'm going to love the way I think is going to best bring more people in. So you want laser lights and fog lights or fog machines? That's fine. As long as it brings more people in and presents me with the opportunity to maybe present more people the gospel. And then you have pastors that started watering down biblical truths started giving watered-down even milk, watered-down milk to everyone. And they had mature sheep, mature Christians, ready to eat meat, starving. All of these movements away from how God has said we are to demonstrate love 
Yes, we are to go and testify. Yes, we are to go and herald this truth in our neighborhood and in our community and across the world. But we are to demonstrate our fidelity to God in action and in love toward one another. And this is grounded in the reality that we have been born again. And speaking of this new birth, this new birth is not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable. So we're speaking of birth, right? And the first thing that comes to mind, like Nicodemus, is wham, human birth, carnal birth. And like with Nicodemus, we have the scriptural truth presented that there's two different births. Just as we talked about in our Theology 101 class, this is all fresh, guys. This is all fresh. It's right here at the forefront of our minds. There is the fleshly birth, the birth under the federal headship of Adam, and there is the regeneration, the new birth in the new federal head that is Jesus Christ. And one is perishable, one is going to die, and one is not. One is eternal, and one is glorious, and one is holy. And that is the point that Peter is belaboring here. You're no longer the flesh. You're no longer the old man. You are supposed to have new affections. And these affections are supposed to encourage you to love one another. Now, once again, let's bring this all into context of where we are. Peter is writing to people that are about to face a growing level of persecution a growing level of antipathy and animosity from the people around them. And he's saying, look, guys, don't get squishy on me. Remember, love one another first. Ground yourselves in this truth. You're born of God? Great. Love one another then because you're going to need one another even more in the times to come when everyone else is going to show you just how much they hate the truth. Hold on to the truth that you are not born of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Do this. Love this way. Purify yourself in obedience to the word of God since or because you've been born again. Martin Luther commenting on it says, again, we should do this because we are not what we were before, he says but have become new creatures. This has not come to pass through works, but is a consequence of the new birth. For thou canst not make the new man, but he must grow or be born. As a husbandman cannot make a tree, but it must grow itself out of the earth. And as we certainly do not become children, the children of Adam, except as we are born and derive sin from our parents. So here it can not come to pass through works that we should become the children of God. But we must also experience the new birth. This, therefore, is what the apostles would say. Since ye then have become new creatures, you should conduct yourselves otherwise than ye did and lead a new life. As ye before lived in hate, ye now are to walk in love. In all respects, the reverse. This is the truth. Before you were a hater. Before you hated God. Before you were run by the former passions and ignorances and a futile life. Now you are the antithesis to the worldly you. Now you have new passions. Now you direct yourself in accordance with the truth that you have been born again. But this truth is guided. Your interactions, your loving, your new way of life is directed through the living and abiding Word of God. Two truths that we've covered over and over again. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any sword. We know that from Hebrews. But it's not only living, not only can it pierce, according to the rest of the Scriptures, we see that the Word of God abides in us through the Holy Spirit. 
That's why John said, you have no need for anyone to teach you. You have the abiding word. You have the Holy Spirit, the second paraclete who testifies to the truth within you. You have the living and abiding word of God. So you direct your passions, you conform yourself, you purify yourself, you set yourself to action in accordance with the living and abiding word of God. Again, Dr. Sproul says, Peter goes on to say that all this occurs through the Spirit. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word through and by means of is emphasized. The word of God is alive. It pulsates with life. It is the very power of God because the word is energized by God himself. We read in Romans that the gospel is the power of God to salvation. Romans 1.16 In Martin Luther's final sermon, he said, If you do not want God to speak to you every day in your house and in your parish church, then be wise. Look for something else. In Trier is our Lord God's coat. In Aiken are Joseph's britches and our blessed lady's chemise. Go there and squander your money. Buy indulgences and the Pope's second-hand junk. Pretty rough. You don't want the truth? Go and buy the filthy rags of the world. Go and buy the indulgences. Get yourself some of that extra meritorious merit that's in the spiritual bank and has numbers unknown. Continuing with the quote, from Dr. Sproul, peasants were making pilgrimages to these places because they thought there was power in Joseph's pants or in Mary's milk. That's not where God has put his power. The power is not in the eloquence of a preacher or in the novelty of a program. The power is in the word of God. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 It is a living word. And it is this living word that directs and guides us. But that's the truth. And truth is offensive. When you tell a brother, even, even when you say it as lovingly as possible, you know, the scriptures tell you that your interactions have to be different here. You can't love worldly people like you love Christian people. That's just biblical truth. I can't tell you the number of people who profess faith who instantly get their hackles up and get angry and emotional and say, well, you don't know, what that's not my God. My God is love. Yes, but your God is love according to how God has revealed love is. And it is your duty to conform your definition of love to what the living word states. And that goes with every other bit of truth. By the way, this is sin. Regardless of what you say, the, the, the first quote from Dr. Sproul, that the world hates objective truth and the, the, the idea of objective truth being revealed in the word of God, which is truth, is something that the world will constantly fight against. There is no such thing as transgenderism or trans species. You are not a dog or a cat. The person in Utah, don't know if he was a male or female, genetically, just having that caveat, who wanted to be treated like a dog or like an animal just a few weeks or months ago is wrong. And it's not wrong because I say it's wrong. It is because the author of truth says it's wrong. He said he created male and female. And anyone in any institution and in any government that says otherwise is in enmity with the truth revealed in Scripture, but that it will always bring about hate towards the heralds of that truth. Jesus said it to his brothers. Hey, you can go. You can go. You can hang out with all the people at the festival. But I can't. 
Because I am a herald of truth, and the world hates truth. Speaking of this living word, speaking of this living and abiding word, Peter quotes from Isaiah saying, All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So we are to purify our souls by obedience to truth for a sincere brotherly love. We are to love one another from a pure heart. This is a truth that can only happen since you have been born again and you have been born again not of perishable seed or not of perishable anything but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God and of the word of God we know this truth. All flesh all of the temporary things, all of the things of this world are passerby. And even the most beautiful and the most glorious flowers that come from the grass are still going to wither. They're going to fade. What we have is something better. The most glorious and beautiful, and they are. Have you guys seen Japanese cherry blossoms? When they're in the, in the throes of it all, it is one of the most beautiful things you can see. Niagara Falls has been taking people's breath away for generations. And yet all of the beauty of the things of this world is going to fade away. All flesh is like grass and all of its glory. All the glory like the flower of the grass and the grass withers and the beautiful things of this world fall away. But there's one thing that never fades in glory. One thing that never fades in power. One thing that never fades in beauty. And that is the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord remains forever. It will always be. And then Peter brings that once again back home and says, And this word, this living and abiding word, this everlasting word, this powerful word, this glorious world which heralds the glorious Redeemer is the good news that was preached to you. And of course, next week we'll get into chapter 2. This is great. This word is great. The Redeemer is great. The good news are great. So because of that, put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and slander. Another call to action based on the glorious truths of God and the gloriousness of the Redeemer, the gloriousness of the gospel, the gloriousness of the good news preached to you. But that'll be next week. We close once again with the words of Paul in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.